Okay. So the next speaker is Giovanni Pellegrino from uh, San Camillo in Venice. And he will be talking about application and pitfalls of EEG, MEG, and fusion source imaging in uh, drug resistant focal epilepsy. Giovanni, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, general topic of my talk. I will be speaking about pre-surgical evaluation uh, in uh, persons with epilepsy. What we usually do, it, it happens in about 30% of patients which, who are refractory to medications and, and uh, keep having seizures. We do a pre-surgical evaluation with non-invasive and invasive techniques. The ultimate goal is to provide information to the surgeon to say if there is any piece of brain that he can scoop, he can cut away so that the patient becomes seizure free. My concentration is especially on uh, uh, MEG and uh, uh, EEG. And my talk is divided in three sections, study of epileptiform discharges with EEG and MEG, magnetic source imaging, electric source imaging and fusion. And the uh, last part, which is make it easy, personalize it and use it. Uh, okay. So the first part is very simple in a way because you already know almost everything about MEG. And this is just an example of an MEG signal of uh, epileptiform activity. We have a CTF system with 275 sensors, it's axial gradiometers. And you see that there is some contamination from EKG artifact. And here you see uh, what is a, a spike in MEG. So it's not very different from EEG, uh, but there are differences in terms of time. This is a very nice and simple example. This is a slip spindle that was recorded during a simultaneous EEG and MEG. And you see very nicely that you can appreciate the slip spindles with EG referential. It's hard to see it with EG bipolar, and it's very hard to detect it with the magnetencephalography, whether you use gradiometers or magnetometers. This is not the only difference between EEG and MEG, but there is also a special difference uh, in terms of sensitivity to different cortical regions as we also heard yesterday. And this is another simple case of a patient with a focal cortical dysplasia that you see very nicely here. Here you have the average of many MEG spikes and the topographical distribution of the magnetic field, the generator which is giving this kind of activity is mainly located over the walls of the sulci. So same patient, same activity, but this time from EEG, so they uh, are exactly the same spikes. This is an average of many spikes, topographical distribution of the electric field. And you see that in this case, the source, which must be the, exactly the same source, is mainly covering the top of the gyrus. So there are complementarities between EEG and MEG. And this is perhaps the reason why we should use them together. It's very clear now, after many years of using these techniques in epilepsy patients, that up to 22% of patients have only uh, MEG spikes, and up to 20% up to or 35% of patients have only EEG spikes. So this, this information comes mainly from combined EEG and MEG studies. So if we want to detect as many spikes as possible, because they are a marker of the irritative zone, we need to record both EEG and MEG. So this is from a summary from a, a clinical perspective uh, about the pros and cons of EEG and MEG and fusion. Here, by fusion, I mean the uh, simultaneous acquisition and analysis of EEG and MEG for the purpose of source localization. I should disclose that I like MEG more, and that's the reason why you see many smiling faces here. It's clinically validator, validated, many sensor results are accurate and consistent. At tissue properties and anomalies have very little impact on the results. Signals are easy to model as compared to EEG, muscle art, fats are less, small generators, it's very sensitive to small generators as compared to EEG. But there are also many cons that you see here, portability, availability, and cost. The idea that combining EEG and MEG may solve problems uh, is somehow true, but it also has it, uh, its cons because, uh, of course, if you need to combine the two techniques, then you will uh, uh, carry over uh, the, the disadvantages of MEG and especially with respect to, uh, to portability, availability, and costs. So after uh, having said that, what do we do with magnetic source imaging, electric source imaging and fusion for epilepsy patients? And here I will share with you, especially what we have been doing in Montreal over the past years for uh, pre-surgical evaluation in epilepsy. This is a simple pipeline that everybody perhaps uh, knows. It's uh, very basic for our analysis. Uh, I don't wanna spend too much time on this. I want to just say that 
uh, the pre processing processing of uh, uh, EEG and MEG is very simple and basic. Especially we try to avoid as much as possible procedures of artifact removal because sometimes it becomes very difficult to appreciate the effect of these procedures on the uh, final outcome. And this cartoon is important for me to say that, uh, as you know, uh, there are many possibilities for inverse solution. And my main concentration is on equivalent current dipole and uh, distributed magnetic source imaging techniques, especially minimum norm estimation and what is indicated here, CMEM, which is the equivalent maximum entropy on the mean method that was developed in Montreal uh, uh, by the group uh, with uh, which I was working in the past. So we go, uh, uh, we move forward with some example. This is an example of what you can get for uh, patients with epilepsy. This is a post-operative MRI of a patient that became seizure-free after surgery. And you see this is the cavity, surgical cavity, and uh, MEG signals, which were recorded uh, over one hour acquisition, topographical distribution, and source localization using CMEM. You see a very nice source very consistently over the right frontal operculum and similar good results, if you wish, with equivalent current dipole. I should say here that the equivalent current dipole is the only technique that uh, is currently approved in the United States and in a few other countries where uh, MEG is considered and applied as a clinical technique for the evaluation of patients with epilepsy. You can see already from this picture that equivalent current dipole is uh, uh, working pretty well. Uh, there is uh, an important difference between uh, these two uh, types of source localization is that with the equivalent current dipole is very difficult or even impossible to say what's the extent of the generator while using distributed magnetic source imaging technique. Uh, maybe uh, you cannot be super accurate, but you can still have an estimation uh, of the special extent of the generator. This is another example, again, a patient that uh, who became seizure-free after surgery. In uh, this case, it was the right frontal pole, uh, again, to show that results in MEG can be very consistent. So you keep doing the exam over one hour, one hour and a half, and you average specs that you record every six minutes or five minutes or the time that you uh, decide, and the results are very good always, or almost always. So we did this uh, study now, it's three years ago. Uh, the idea is, okay, we have been using for 30 years, for 40 years maybe, equivalent current dipole technique as the uh, approach uh, for evaluating patients with epilepsy, uh, but perhaps distributed magnetic source imaging works similarly well or even better. That's why we run this analysis on 340 source localizations from about 50 patients with focal epilepsy. And we compared here the accuracy, which is the localization error, considering the dipole uh, versus the ground truth and uh, the vertex with the maximal amplitude of the map of distributed magnetic source imaging. And you see that distributed magnetic source imaging with CMEM works pretty well, even better than equivalent current dipole. In this other picture, uh, we know very uh, well that the head model, the forward model, is very important, especially for EEG on group level. It, for MEG, it doesn't seem to, uh, to have a, a strong effect so that the localization error is the same whether you use single sphere with equivalent current dipole, overlapping spheres with equivalent current dipole, overlapping spheres with uh, distributed magnetic source imaging or PEM with distributed magnetic source imaging. And this is basically replicating results that have been already achieved uh, before. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, actually, uh, distributed magnetic source imaging can provide a, a different level of accuracy, but may, in some cases, uh, provide information about the special extent of the generator. And uh, here you can see it very nicely. So these are all non thresholded maps of distributed magnetic source imaging from the same intrinsic spikes. You see CMEM, MNE, DSPM, and SLORETA. The distribution of the map is different, and in the case of CMEM, you have a high contrast so that all the activity, uh, all the intensity of the map is concentrated in a region which happens to be in the surgical cavity for this patient, while for other uh, methods, it's spreading around here and there. If you look at this picture here, this graph here, we again measure the localization error, which is pretty similar and overall very good it's below one centimeter for all these methods. And then you see that there is this other, what we simply thought is that perhaps that these methods are uh, somehow 
displacing the source here and there with a different degree and possibly direction of the error. So if we normalize map and we make a simple average, we will take what is good and we will mitigate the uh, localization error. And that happens to be the case so that the average map uh, of all these methods seems to provide better results. Going back a little to the uh, estimation of the spatial extent of the generator, there are many studies now suggesting that this is not possible with some techniques, for instance, minimum norm estimation, but it is possible with some others, for instance, CMAN. You see these are maps for different patients. Threshold is 0%, which means that this is a raw map from CMAM, or you can apply a, a, a threshold 30% of the local maximum which means that you cut uh, away, you put to zero, everything is below 30% of the maximum of the map. You can see it here. And it becomes a clean map and it provides perhaps uh, the special extent of the generator. But it's very clear here, this is the map size number of uh, vertices that are non-zero as a function of the threshold that you apply to your maps. And you increase the threshold and your map will become of course smaller, uh, but uh, you reach very quickly uh, a point where increasing the threshold doesn't make a big uh, difference for CMEM. Uh, and this point is around 30% of the threshold of the maximal amplitude. So that with other studies, we demonstrated that with this method, if you apply 30% threshold, you get close to what is the extent of the generator. It is important to say that you have a, a price to pay uh, in CMEM for this uh, trick and for this information is that you are basically uh, shutting off parcel which are likely not to contribute to the source that you are estimating. Uh, so this is very good if you want to uh, find your source and if you want to find the uh, extent of the generator, but you pay a price because uh, the activity in other cortical regions is uh, close to zero. Uh, so you basically are in trouble if you want to estimate, for instance, connectivity. So you, you need to change your pipeline a little to, to achieve that goal. But what if you find in your MEG some activity like this one? This is an epileptic seizure. And you see here that there are differences in the signal between MEG and EEG. This seizure was recorded during simultaneous EEG and EEG. And the first question that arises here is what's the seizure onset? When is the seizure onset happening? This is not a, a simple uh, question to answer. And it's very important. It is very important because if you localize your activity after the seizure onset, you are localizing propagated activity. If you localize too early, you are basically localizing resting state activity. So uh, is there any simple way to solve this? Uh, perhaps yes, there are ways. Uh, our idea is that uh, if instead of just considering the time course of your signal, you perform a time frequency decomposition, then this may help you in identifying at what time point of what frequency is more involved in the seizure onset. And then you need a method to uh, kind of invert this information, this data from the uh, time frequency plane to the cortical space, uh, and then you check whether your method works or not. That's what we did in uh, this uh, uh, study in 2016. We basically select a large time window and then approximately what you believe is the seizure onset uh, time and you perform a time frequency decomposition, you select your frequency and time of interest. And then there is a procedure with a discrete wavelet transformation and CMEM. This is another ver version of the maximum entropy on the mean, which is especially meant to localize each box of time frequency decomposition. For each box, you get a map. And since you may have multiple uh, blocks uh, uh, of uh, interest, you have multiple maps and here you can apply uh, a, a dimensional reduction technique. In our case, it was a simple PCA and you get only one map, which you hope will correspond to the seizure onset zone. Is that true? Most of the time, yes. This is an example of a patient here we had the implantation with deaf electrodes so we could see where the uh, onset zone is. Uh, and this is uh, interictal source imaging. And these are basically 11 seizures that were recorded during uh, an MEG acquisition. And you see that for all seizures, uh, the localization is pretty good, is uh, uh, very consistent, and is uh, more or anything concordant with uh, where the uh, um, uh, seizure of that zone was as assessed uh, with uh, the FL electrodes. If we consider the entire group, which at the time was one of the largest cores of uh, seizures, it's working pretty well. 
uh, there are many findings, but the more important are perhaps these two here. Uh, so basically, uh, you can perform um, uh, source localization of uh, decision on its own from EEG and MEG. MEG works better than EEG. And uh, typically, you would like to have a seizure for source localization, but if you do not have a seizure in terrestrial, source localization is similarly good. The third information very important from this paper is, I you see these points here, it's not true that the procedure works always. In some cases, it's simply wrong when you get a source that is up to 10 centimeters, eight centimeters far away from where it should be. These are not a big problem from a clinical point of view because you can flag them very nicely, very easily. They simply do not make sense. In a clinical perspective, those that are very dangerous are these here. So if the source is displaced by two centimeters, four centimeters, uh, that might be misleading. And uh, it's a, 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 an information that you need to weigh together with all other available clinical information. So if, the, uh, if we, uh, we verified at this time that WMEM is good for localizing oscillations, so we thought that it could be used also for high frequency oscillations in patients with epilepsy. And this is an entire pipeline and it works pretty well. Uh, for uh, um, fast oscillations in the, also in the ripple band. And also here, the source localization is very good and concordant with the uh, ground truth, and it can be useful for the assessment of patients with epilepsy. And this is another application also for, uh, in this case, connectivity analysis of resting state activity. The inversion here was uh, performed using a modified version of WMEM, so you localize uh, frequency in the alpha band, and you compute connectivity on what is the uh, um, irritative zone and the contralateral zone. And the ultimate goal in this paper was to assess what's the relationship between connectivity patterns and seizure freedom after surgery. And actually there, there is a relationship so that perhaps with a larger sample size, we can uh, uh, get to a point where we can estimate uh, the uh, probability of becoming seizure-free based on MEG connectivity measures. And the same application, this is uh, another study identifying, trying to identify the relationship between uh, uh, cortical activity and oscillation and cognition in patients with epilepsy. The idea in this case was that whenever you have an epilepsy spike, uh, you have perhaps something that happens that occurs uh, also for regions that are at a distance from the epilepsy focus. And instead of uh, those far regions just uh, having the bad effects of uh, epilepsy spikes, they may react to these spikes with some inhibitory or some uh, kind of safety activity. This was our hypothesis. And if that's true, we would expect that this activity would be perhaps in alpha band. So we identified regions over the posterior quadrant and patients with anterior epilepsy and we checked what is the uh, activity that you get in the posterior quadrant at the time of the spikes for frontal patients and temporal patients. There isn't much for temporal lobe epilepsy, but in the posterior quadrant, there is a, a storm of alpha activity after the spike, which is very clear and nice and distributed over multiple regions. And you see it here with individual results for frontal lobe epilepsy and temporal lobe epilepsy. And the distribution of this activity over the posterior region is rather widespread, but what is more important is that the higher is the amount of uh, alpha activity that is triggered by anterior spike in the posterior head region, and the better is the cognitive profile. So if your cortex far away from the epileptic focus is able to react to defend itself uh, from uh, interictal spikes, then your cognition will be better. So EEG and MEG source localization of this uh, different types of activity, what about fusion? So fusion techniques have been developed over many years now. It's more than 20 years. And we try to, do, to, to, uh, to give a, our little contribution here with a, an entire pipeline, which includes fusion. The idea is that during simultaneous EEG and MEG acquisition, you have multiple spikes. And for uh, each spike, you have multiple time points that might be of interest. And in, uh, uh, within all this information, you want to get what is most important for the benefit of your patient. So uh, we take all spikes and multiple time points, a time window between 50 to 100 milliseconds around the peak of the spike, and we apply fusion. Fusion is here within MEM, and it happens, it occurs at different levels of the inverse solution. So if you have, let's say, 100 spikes and you have 100 time points, you will get with a, 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 a multitude of maps 
and you need to choose which one is the good one. Uh, so to do that, you perform uh, dimensionality reduction, you get cluster and the cluster with the maximum number of maps is the one which is closer to the, uh, to the uh, true source. I'll go very fast. Five more minutes. Yes, Thank you. so I skip a few of them uh, to say that uh, fusion is good regardless of the number of sensors that you use. And the problem is this one, that basically uh, this technique, which is very useful for patients with epilepsy is underused. And it is underused because uh, uh, MEG is not available and it's very costly. This is the picture in, in North America, but it's very similar in Europe. So uh, we are not giving enough care to our patients. How do we do? What do we do to make, to give more care uh, is that we have to simplify it. And one way to do that is to use EEG instead of MEG if it can provide useful information for our patients. And under some circumstances, that's possible. There are previous studies saying that perhaps low resolution EEG can be uh, clinically good, similarly good to high resolution EEG. And this has been confirmed very recently in 2020. So the clinical impact of low resolution EEG is not significantly different in clinical management from high resolution EEG. So to, uh, to move towards that direction, we need to understand what are the determinants, the factors that may affect uh, these techniques. And one is the number of channels, but there are other factors. For instance, the signal to noise ratio. So how we do the acquisitions of EEG and the distribution of channels. And I will go very clearly here. This is a, a simulation study that was done many years ago in Montreal, Benar Gottman. They were saying that basically uh, it, you do not need to use a, a, an homogeneous uh, sampling sp uh, of, with EEG electrodes of your head, uh, but the sampling should be um, uh, more dense over the region where there is your prior, where you believe that the generator might be, and then electrodes can be far away in other regions. And we tried recently to uh, move forward on, in this direction. And we performed this uh, study on 24 patients during simultaneous EEG and MEG. Basically, this is source localization from EEG 1020 system. So it's 19 electrodes localization error, average localization error is 15 millimeters. What happens if you add a few channels around the channel with the maximal amplitude of the spike in average montage, you see it here that just adding three channels, you get to a source localization error that is on average below one centimeter. You may think that this is simply related to adding channels, that's not the case, because if you take random channels and you add them one by one, you do not get the same improvement of source localization accuracy. And if you compare these uh, results with the localization error of similar spikes and patients with MEG infusion, you see that just with EEG, if properly done and personalized, you get to a reasonable and clinically useful source, lo uh, source localization accuracy. So my take home message uh, is that non-invasive mathematics that is beyond the things that I presented here and which uh, I do not completely understand is very useful in clinical practice, even, if, uh, even to those who do not understand it, both physicians and patients. The surgical evaluation of epilepsy patients can rely on multiple advanced and very accurate techniques for the characterization of the epileptic focus. In daily clinical practice, we do as much as we can, fusion, MSI, density, GSI, but if costly machines are not available, then we need to find solutions, uh, especially for the clinical practice, and we need to make it easy, personalize it, and use it. And here, uh, all studies were done in Montreal, and my acknowledgement, people with whom I've been working over the past years, Elianko Bayash and Christoph Grova, and I take just one second to say that we will be hiring soon in, in, uh, in Venice. So if you know anybody that might be interested in uh, MEG, EEG source localization, uh, please just drop an email. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you very much, beautiful results and beautiful talk. Um, are there questions from the audience? Um, I don't see raising hands. Uh, well, in the meantime, I have one for sure. I will I have many, many questions. One is at the beginning, you mentioned that um, so there are spikes you see only with MEG, spikes you see only with EEG. I, unless I miss it, you didn't give a reason for this. Is that 
mostly an orientation fact for these? So, yeah, the uh, empirical uh, thing is that that's true. What are the reasons? Uh, it's unclear. It's a combination perhaps of uh, size of the generator orientation or where the source is placed. And uh, in the data that I was presenting, there were many quotes say, uh, from different uh, papers. They say that up to 20 or 25 or up to 30% of spikes can be detected with MEG or EEG only. In our experience uh, in Montreal, this percentage is much less. So uh, only about eight to 10% of patients have MEG spikes and do not have EEG spikes. Mm. So it also depends on, uh, uh, you know, uh, up to now, uh, spike detection is uh, mainly based on uh, visual inspection. So it also depends on uh, uh, how sensitive you, you are and it's difficult to estimate the rate of false positive and false negative, so yeah. Okay, okay, so thank you. There's a question by Franca Tecchio. Franca, you can unmute yourself. Oh, do you listen to me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hi, good morning. It was great to uh, listen to your one fantastic talk. And uh, one question is, uh, when uh, you mention uh, those cases where even the fusion, uh, so both uh, EEG and MEG wrong uh, in localizing, uh, uh, there were quite differences in EEG and MEG. Are the same patients or not? So, uh, well, uh, source localization in patients with epilepsy is, of course, uh, a complex procedure with many steps. Uh, so the error may happen at different uh, points of the chain. Uh, the thing is that there are some very difficult patients for whom whatever you do, source localization is not accurate. And this is not only our experience, uh, it's uh, also the experience of other centers. I was showing one of the papers from Pittsburgh, uh, appreciating the same. For some patients- So typically are the same patients where- Typically they are wrong. the same patients. Typical. But uh, is, if you apply uh, more complex techniques uh, for those patients, for the same patients, fusion seems to work much better as compared to EG or MEG alone. The thing is, uh, how much time consuming it is? Do you have an MEG available? Uh, you, you spend hours for placing EEG electrodes, uh, and then what's the true advantage for the patient? So you have to wait in the, all this information and then to establish whether that few millimeters of uh, accuracy, more accuracy, uh, truly make a, a difference in your uh, clinical management. In fact, they were impressive, the results uh, with a few channels uh, uh, made more dense uh, in the first guess area. It yeah. was really, so really impressive. That's not finished yet. It's preliminary. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this has not been done previously, except there are two small papers from Florida in, in children, and they were using it with a very good accuracy, but not systematic evaluation of this uh, perspective, which is very good because uh, very few people have a MEG and it's too costly to be used uh, on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? I also wanted to ask you, uh, um, the, the methods, the most advanced methods you specified, they are in Brainstorm, is that correct? They are available in Brainstorm. Yes, they are, available, they are available in Brainstorm. Our analysis have been done with the uh, Brainstorm. And uh, yeah, everything okay. is in there. I mean, not exactly everything. For instance, the version of WMAM that uh, is able to properly recover the time course of the signal level where over the sur cortical surface, I, I'm not sure is already in Brainstorm. I mean, okay. uh, the method, uh, what I was mentioning earlier that uh, as uh, one uh, aspect that in order to detect the spatial extent, it has to turn off some parcel of cortical surface. So if you do that, then you do not have a good reconstruction of the 10 course of the signal far, far away from your source. Mm -hmm. So if you want to use it, let's say for uh, then estimating cortical connectivity or networks, uh, you need to have the entire signal without this feature of uh, turning off parcels. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, Th thank you very much, Giovanni. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, very, very, very interesting. I think it's, it's time to go to the next speaker.